Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'd like to also say welcome to the people who are watching from abroad. We are so thrilled to be here for this meaningful discussion that we're going to have this afternoon. My name is Ron Stern, and I am the new vice president of Gallaudet starting just two months ago. As the vice president, I'm responsible for the Clare Center, and it is an honor and privilege for me to be here today with you. It is also an honor to be here for Bobby Cordano's inauguration week. We're here in honor of her passion and her vision that many of us also share. Her office has asked Dr. Carol Erding, who is our provost at Gallaudet University, and myself to plan for this important event. Carol and I have worked together wonderfully. It's been a pleasure to work with her. And this afternoon, she actually is holding a slightly different role for us. She is, in fact, our timekeeper. So thank you, Dr. Erding, for that role. <laughs> We have six panelists planned for this evening. One of our panelists is a parent and is supposed to be getting here at any moment. Of course, DC traffic is even worse than New York traffic is, I, much to my surprise. Uh, I'm obviously a New Yorker. Uh, but with that said, we are here to celebrate and honor the translation of important scientific findings that have been found by VL2, our Visual Language and Visual Learning Center and Lab here on campus. Those findings state that obviously the brain does not discriminate against language modality. And we'll talk more about that later. This is a stepping board. This is a springboard for us to begin our discussions to take science and scientific findings and translate them to real world applications. We have our esteemed panelists here to help us with this conversation and engage our thinking in advancing VL2's work. We want to bring this work to the real world. Now, it all starts in infancy. Our infants and deaf children cannot wait. And I doubt that any one person here knows every single panelist today, but we will be letting them introduce themselves to you just shortly. We want to give you an opportunity to match names to faces. I don't know if you can take a guess from looking at that list up there, who's sitting in front of you. But these panelists represent a variety of different roles. We have six panelists, five who are here at the moment. Two are parents, four are professionals. And we know in our small world, more often than not, we hold more than one role in our lives. And as a matter of fact, four of our panelists here are in fact parents of deaf children as well, but we have asked them each to maintain within their specific role that they're representing on the panel as much as they possibly can today. Uh, we want to have cross-representation of a number of different roles and different views and perspectives brought to this conversation. I will let each of them tell you more about what role they will be holding. Just quickly here, this is our program for the next hour and a half. We only have 90 minutes together, which is very short. I wish we had more time than that. But we will be a bit hard pressed for our time this afternoon, which is why we have our esteemed timekeeper here keeping us on track to make sure we can make it through our entire program. The purpose of this panel is again to take the findings from VL2, which are in fact groundbreaking. They have obliterated the myths and misconceptions that have been held far and wide by many people for many years. Time is of the essence. The need for exposure to children's brains is very clear and evident from the moment that they are born. We need to be providing them visual access, providing them language access, providing them access to their world from day one. That has a profound impact on brain development, on cognitive development, on language development. It even supports the development of speech and auditory listening skills. So with that said, I'd like to ask each of our panelists to share their thoughts <coughs> about the roles that they hold and how it relates to the VL2 findings. After each panelist has gone through their introduction, and they each have up to five minutes to share information with you, uh, which we'll talk about who they are, what roles they hold. 
they will then be asking a couple of questions. And I'll explain more about that as we go through. Once they're done with their presentations, we have three questions for them to ask. And they, we will ask each question one at a time. And the panelists will choose which questions they would like to answer and respond to. Now, if we have time, and again, 90 minutes is a short amount of time, but if we make it through this in that, we will have an opportunity for a Q&A session at the end. It might be brief. We might have time for just a couple of questions. And then we will have to wrap up. All right, everybody on board? Great. So with that, our first panelist is our parent, Norma Moran. And I'll let Norma respond to these questions. We've asked them to talk briefly about their background, uh, personally as well as, uh, as professionally, if that applies. And also talk about VL2's findings, what evidence they've come to, and the impact that it has on each panelist. So for Norma, it would be the impact on her as a parent. And what the thoughts are for new parents who have just had an infant who's been identified uh, as deaf and based on their own experience and having her own children, and based on the information from VL2's findings, which were perhaps not around just yet when her own children were born. So with that, I give you Norma. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. And thank you, Dr. Stern, for welcoming me. It's such an honor to be here. I didn't expect to go first, however. <laughs> but I'm very uh, eager for this discussion. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. I was born in El Salvador in South America. And it s appears that I was born deaf, but then was not identified until later. There was a war going on in our country. Eventually, they did realize that I had a hearing loss only because I ran across the street and my parents yelled after me. And I, of course, didn't respond, even though there was a truck coming up the way, and it was a very dangerous situation. Of course, they realized that my response wasn't normal, and they took me to the capital city in El Salvador, and indeed, it was found that I was deaf. My mother was rather young. She was only 22 years old at the time. She only had um, education up to third grade and was pretty much a rural type of person and had no idea what to do. The doctor did let them know that the United States has a cure for deafness. And uh, during that time in 79, during the war, uh, some of my family members were in fact disappearing and we didn't know what was happening to them and we realized it was not safe to stay in the country. So me and my mom left. We went through Guatemala, Mexico, California, and eventually landed in Nevada. It was such a blessing to be there. And the reason for that is, is because we ran into a young hearing teacher who had just finished her degree in special education. And <clears throat> she was very excited to work with deaf people. And I think it was fate that I ended up working with her. Luckily, because of that, I had access to language, even though it was a little bit later in life at the age of three. So that's my background. I was exposed to language at three. And it was <coughs> English uh, at the time, or C. That's what was prevalent during those years. My sister uh, was deaf also. And uh, we had children, or she had children, and they were hearing, and then uh, a second and third child and realized that they were deaf, which was interesting. Because I grew up struggling with this whole experience, and then here were my children who were going to be deaf as well. It was really quite an event. And how old are your children now? I have an 11-year-old, a 2-year-old, and a 10-month-old. All three are here with me. If you hear them, <laughs> my apologies. They might be making a little noise over there. So my youngest are deaf, as I said. And it was a time for me to look at myself and my own beliefs around access. 
However, it was different because as a mother, I was responsible to make sure my children had access. So a little bit of a different role. And then VL2 came on the scene, and I think it was about you know two or three years ago that they started really putting out some of their research and publications and apps as well. So my two-year-old is able to grow up with those. One of my favorite memories is when my two eldest were sharing a story with the youngest. They had an iPad set up. And my second son's name is Ramon, okay? And uh, he was saying, okay, you need to look at me, and he's signing to my youngest, who is Teofilo. And they basically modeled exactly what we as parents did in terms of sharing stories. And VL2 really gave us that, those skills that was then passed on to our children. It was wonderful to see that kind of growth. And those resources are so important. Thank you so much. Our next uh, panelist will be, oh, unfortunately, Tyrone Jackson is not yet here. So we are hoping that he will join us shortly. Uh, but with that, we will move on to our third panelist. Hello, everyone. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be here today. I'll take a moment to introduce myself. I'm Barbara Ramundo, as you know, and my role is really as a consultant. I'm currently working with the CEASD, the Conference of Educational Administrators of Schools and Programs for the Deaf, which is an organization that advocates and represents all deaf schools across the country. And I have worked with various organizations um, in my past, the American Society for Deaf Children being one of them, NAD. as well as NAD, where I was an attorney. an attorney, and also the board president for the Maryland School for the Deaf. I'm also a parent of deaf children, as Dr. Stern mentioned. I have two, two deaf children who are already adults, So the findings from VL2 are really exciting for me as an advocate. Because we can see that there are many programs and systems across the country that need further support, specifically for newborn screenings that occur in the hospital. About 75% of those <coughs> infants are screened, at which point they are found to either be deaf or not. But there are significant gaps in that system. And there are two that I'd like to highlight. There is one uh, which is an issue of training. And Gallaudet, of course, has a wonderful program for early intervention and various other training programs. But there are very few programs across the country that are training early interventionists. People who are working with families with deaf children are not focusing on deaf infants or infants at all. So to have research that is showing where early intervention can provide effective support with deaf specialists and how that involvement is much more effective is significant. And we have not had that. And we have to certainly grow that and mature that with our universities. And programs where families are going and looking for support, again, I mentioned that Gallaudet has a fabulous program here with the Parent Infant, Infant Program, but there are many parents across the country and abroad that don't have access to such programs. And many early intervention programs don't have deaf education speci specialists as a part of those programs. So VLT, too, is providing great research and has wonderful scientists. And we really need to grow those programs and tie in the research findings and their work with those programs. And I look forward to that. Great. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, so that actually goes back to what uh, Norma had talked about, um, being born in another country, um, you know, and comparing what your parents knew as compared to what you know now and the impact that uh, Gallaudet has had, the access to VL2's work. And uh, you knew that you had uh, some knowledge being an, a deaf person and growing up with deaf experiences, but then it made an impact on raising deaf children for yourself. 
Definitely. What it did was spur a thirst in me for more knowledge. Right, and you can see a big difference in the achievement of your children. That is absolutely true. Wonderful. Thank you, Barbara. Hello. I am Beth Benedict, and I am absolutely thrilled that I was asked to be here on this panel for early intervention. Many of you who know me know that I have a passion for early intervention, and I see a lot of you affirming this, yes. Um, I really began to be involved because I had two deaf children who are now 25 and 27. So, you know, I had known uh, certainly that there were attitudes, negative attitudes about deaf people in their language, but I have to be honest, I didn't really realize that until I had my own children. And I experienced the screenings where I was told they failed. And, you know, I went through this testing system and I wasn't really quite clear myself how to navigate it. And again, thinking 95% of our deaf children have hearing parents, and thinking about what limited information they have. And so I really started to think about those, that population. I mean, we as deaf people are only 5% of the parents. So this is what really, encouraged me to find out more. And I went through three parent-infant programs with my children. I don't think they needed it necessarily. I think it was more of a benefit for me to see what parents really experience. And in those three parent-infant programs, they had very different philosophies and beliefs and procedures. These were all in DC, mind you, right here, with our large, deaf community, we still had such a variation. Then you want to consider what it might look like in rural areas where there might be even less information. And then in other areas where there would be zero information. Because of all this, I, I decided to study uh, my P for a PhD. I looked at different organizations and I studied policies. I sat on uh, some boards for the American Society for the Deaf. Uh, I think I was on that board for 12 or 13 years. Actually, I'm still on the board, I've lost count. And in those experiences, I think that the biggest, one of the biggest milestones was joining the Commission on Infant Hearing. The Joint Commission on Infant Hearing. So this was a commission that, um, a working commission that represented seven organizations, such as A.G. Bell, Alexander Graham Bell, um, and help me out, who were the other organizations? Right, uh, the American Au Academy of Audiologists, uh, um, so forth. So those are the types that are being, and they had two representatives from each of those uh, agencies or organizations and we were to develop a uh, paper together. But there was not one word in this document about ASL. And that is why things are the way they are. That paper that was produced was a paper that every audiology student will look at. If you ask any audiology student, they will know what you're referring to. So I sat on this commission and I eventually became chair of this commission for two years. And I am proud to say that I was able to make some changes and have ASL in the document and develop ASL mentorship programs. But my next challenge, or the next step, was to really put some teeth to those policies. You know, we can have policies, but they, they don't have teeth. They're ineffective. So I really believe that is our next challenge, our next step. I was also one of the two founders for the Infant Toddler Family Certification Program here at Gallaudet. I think it's now in its sixth year, I believe. And this is where we're really trying to build networks. I think a lot of people don't realize that each state has an eddy or early hearing uh, interventionist or advisory council. Okay, uh, We have this in 50 states, mind you. 
Only eight of those 50 have deaf representatives. I know my time is out, and I will be able to respond to more of this as, uh, uh, as the panel proceeds. So I'm interested in your mentioning of the need for teeth within these policies. Do you think that the VL2 findings will help you with putting teeth in there, <laughs> that, that teeth issue that you have? My biggest regret is that that information and that research wasn't around when my children were infants. It is a regret, I have to be honest. But it also, like I said, led to my getting involved doing all this work. And when so often what we hear these people say is, well, where's the resources? Where's the research? And now we can say, here it is. And that saves me a lot of work. And, uh, but getting the message across is another type of challenge. Right. Resources are one thing, but hard science and evidence and documentation is another. Uh, do you think that you'll use that with JCIH? I do. Now, if, if you uh, see my presentations, you see that I always include resources and VL2 is always listed, and Gallaudet as well, and the Clare Center, because of the wonderful work that's going on here. Wonderful. Thank you for that. I'm moving on to our next panelist. Thank you very much. It's a tremendous honor for me to be here today, especially with this, uh, with this special week. So again, thank you very, very much. I should probably start my talk with an apology because as a college professor, we can't really say anything in five minutes. When I think about, I'll tell just a very little bit about, uh, about myself. I'm a surgeon at Johns Hopkins Hospital about half of my surgery experiences in hearing restoration, including cochlear implants, stapes surgery, and the bone anchored hearing aid. And the other half has to do with tumors involving the side of the head for uh, children and adults with, uh, with benign and cancerous tumors. About one fourth of all of my surgical cases involve children from the little child who accidentally inhaled a thumbtack last week to someone who was going to be having a cochlear implant. When I look back historically at the things that have had the largest impact on child survival in the history of medicine, it probably has to be the invention that came out of France in the 1800s, which was such a simple notion. For premature babies, the death rate was about 66%. And in one year, in one hospital, when someone constructed an incubator, a device for maintaining the safe habitat and a warm environment for a baby, that death rate was cut in half. There probably will never be an innovation in medical history that has such a profound impact on the quality and quantity of someone's life, because those are people who were saved as children, and then went on to live their entire lives. All other medical developments, heart surgery, cancer treatments, they won't hold anything near that impact. So the idea of a metaphor now for an incubator, a place where a person can have a safe environment, a gathering of ideas that we can tap into to access how human language and human cognitive development happens in the human mind, in my opinion, that's one of the most powerful and important developments that's come out of the VL2 labs. That we take all children and think about how language with a capital L acquires that information through vision. And all children, whether they're naturally hearing, hard of hearing, completely deaf, or have some technology that assists them, that tapping into that mechanism of providing information and getting that content to the human mind is one of the most important things that we have to do. And that that technology and that that innovation and that thought can happen and is coming from here is gonna have that same impact on the quantity and quality of that child's life and their mental development. And that's really one of the main reasons, that's the why of what I do, what I do, and why I think it's so important that we access that information for all children at that, at that early age. Yeah. 
Wonderful. I think that really makes you a truly unique individual. I have always wondered uh, what the considerations were and uh, what training looks like for those in the field of pathology and medicine and how these new findings uh, that may contradict those uh, trainings, uh, if it is perhaps hard for practitioners to incorporate them for you or your peers to really read, understand, and adopt these new findings. Your thoughts? I think it's always nice to condense something down into one single question. And so what I teach medical students and every single doctor that graduates from Johns Hopkins Hospital hears this. When I'm meeting a family for the first time and we're asking and talking about these things, I ask the one question, what do I need to know about you and your family to help take care of you? That opens the door for different perspectives, different opinions, finding out all the different elements that make up that person's experience as a, as a human being, whether that's a small nine-month-old human being or someone who's 55 and is considering retiring at the prime of their life because they've lost the ability to discriminate speech. That's been the most helpful thing for me to try to help teach other trainees some of these ideas about how to think about the whole person not just the one question, the one problem that we're addressing. Great, thank you very much. And now on to our next panelist. Hi everyone, I'm Debbie Trapani, and I currently work as the principal at Kendall School, uh, Kendall Elementary School. Prior to my time at Kendall, I've been in a professional for 25 years, and I started my work as a preschool teacher. And in fact, some of my former students are here as parents of children at school now. Uh, but th that aside, I started my work as a preschool teacher, and I worked at Kendall at the time. I then got a job in Delaware, and I moved there. And the reason that I mention this is because my work in Delaware was as a parent infant teacher. And that meant that I had the balance of working with both the children in the playroom and also doing home visits and interacting with the families. At that time, this was roughly 20 years ago, I wanted to make sure that the parents were knowledgeable and had information and that they could make informed decisions. So I was always out there looking for any research I could get my hands on in order to share with the families. I wanted to talk about the importance of language, of sign language, of spoken language. Uh, some parents wanted to go the route of spoken language and if that worked with their children, of course they could do that. Um, and I always talked about the fact that it was a both approach, not an either or approach. Language is the important piece. We need to get language into our children's brains. And if we can do that, they develop well. And the earlier, the better, of course. Now, this was years ago, so that search for information was a tough one. I was all over the place looking for research. And in Delaware at that time, uh, internet access was very limited. <coughs> of course, today is an entirely different world. But as I was gathering that information, I was printing it out, creating binders and folders, and sharing it with every family I possibly could. And soon after that, uh, Eddie, the uh, early hearing detention, detection intervention uh, uh, program was uh, established in Delaware. And um, uh, there are so many acronyms, I can't keep track of them all. But uh, NCHAM was also developed. And they started to disseminate information. And the state then created their own advisory board. And Barbara Raimondo uh, was in touch with Delaware, contacted me, and asked me to get involved with that committee. And I said, sure, why not? So I hopped on board. And uh, it really was my the first time that many of us who, uh, many of the people on the committee had met a deaf person, in fact, uh, was when I joined the committee. And I realized how much those people really didn't know, but how much they thought they did, and how dangerous that was. The knowledge was all over the board, the amount of knowledge, what people thought they knew. And so, over time, we started to develop some awareness and some shared understandings and common ground. And later on, I became the administrator. I was a coordinator of statewide services, and that meant that I worked with families. I met with families uh, and 
it was the statewide services for uh, the education of deaf students and, and specifically supporting families, and I worked as an early interventionist. And through those years, I realized that early intervention was not just about working with the children, uh, but also working with the families and the educational systems, and also supporting the educational service providers who work with the children and their families. And that that piece is just as critical, because they're working with children up to the age of five years, of, uh, of five years old, and they must have that knowledge too. And this was before VL2. And the findings from VL2, to me, were awe-inspiring, right? It was validation of all of the work that I had been doing over years and years. Uh, that was amazing to me. It really felt like a culmination of years of work and years of support that I had invested. And for me, my goal has always been, throughout all of this work, uh, is for parents and families to have the opportunity to make a truly informed decision, which means they have to have access to information, be it research, be it what's going on out there in the field. They need to know what to do with their children, and they need to know now. It can't be a we'll explain it to you later type situation. They have to know now, and VL2 makes that possible. Now, I think that one of the challenges really is uh, that we have the VL2 research available, but what is happening within each of the 50 states, and I've talked at length with Barbara about this, um, and Beth as well, each of the 50 states have their own interpretation of the research and the information. And so you're it's, it's kind of like dealing with 50 different countries even, because um, they all use <clears throat> the EDI policies in their own ways, and they all interpret them in their own ways. So getting the VL2 research connected to all of those people and then connected to the services that are provided for fami to families is challenging. But we do need to ensure that children have access to language, that families and parents have access to information, and that needs to ha and services as well, and that needs to happen immediately. Nope. Like it or not, you know, Gallaudet and Washington, D.C., uh, and Baltimore as well, the onus is truly on all of us to show and demonstrate these practices and the changes that need to, to take place. It's really on us to do that, and if we can't do it here ourselves, uh, then I'm not sure w how we can expect change to happen anywhere else. So it really is a unique and exciting position to be in, uh, to be starting this change of systemic programs and systems and individual change as well. Yeah, I'd agree with that. That's absolutely important. Truly, this is the time of opportunity. This is when we can leverage the work that's being done because parents don't have to be fluent signers. The VL2 research is saying that the parents don't have to be fluent signers. It's okay if they aren't fluent, that any type of access to visual language from day one is what's gonna help their children. And so now it's up to us in how we can support their children, uh, support them in supporting their children for the rest of their lives and providing access to more information uh, so that their infants can get that information and their brain can develop uh, on a better path. So with that, I believe we'll move on to the first of our three questions. I do not believe Mr. Jackson is here yet, unfortunately. Okay. So our first question. We're first going to focus on policy and practice. So what needs to happen in policy or practice for deaf infants that would lead to better educational and whole person outcomes? Which means better literacy skills. Uh, included. So whole person outcomes is what we're looking at. How do we make change in policy or practice to, to better that? You know, let me actually start off with an answer to that. I think there are two pieces that are critical here. One is professional development for the professionals who are already in the field working with families right now. There's a lot of research and a lot of information. We have to translate that to actual practice with the professionals. We need to connect them to the information. So professional development needs to be provided. And secondly, it's our educational training programs. Our teacher training programs are critical. And with those programs, especially looking at those programs, every state, again, has their own interpretation and they have their own view of what teacher qualifications are. And so I knew in Delaware that we struggled with this because we would hire early intervention teachers, but their background in early intervention 
may not have been uh, recognized as a high, highly qualified teacher by the state, even though they, they had qualifications for working with that age group. And so there are differences in those requirements. And teacher training programs might have you know, qualifications and, and might provide a good background, but might not be recognized by the particular state that you're trying to hire someone in. And so I think that's something that we need to think about. Every state really needs to look at what their policies are for early intervention. Uh, Beth, I see you want to say something here. You know, I actually, think, I actually think a lot about this question as an advocate. You know, when and where should we move? So I've been looking at this for a long time. I think there are three major groups that we need to look at. Audiologists and other medical uh, personnel, and then the community, the deaf community. And we need to look at educators as the third group. Now, I find myself maybe working with medical professionals. And sure, we know in the deaf community, we know that early intervention is very important. And maybe people say that they want to be a role model to help that effort, but they don't know where to begin. And so we need to work with the deaf community and the medical community and educators. In working with medical personnel, uh, let me ask you, do you know how many audiology training programs we have in the United States? Anybody want to take a guess? Just, there's about 200 training programs for audiologists in the United States. Out of those 200, anybody want to guess uh, how many require their audiologists to know some sign language? It's really one, maybe two. We know it's one, we know Gallaudet does, okay? So we need to ask ourselves if we're doing a good enough job in collaborating with our audiology students right here. Perhaps we could do a better job knowing that it is even worse in other audiological programs. So one or two out of 200? Sacramento, California says that they maybe include ASL, but we haven't really been able to verify that. Now there's another 20 training programs that do offer ASL as an elective. The remaining 180 have no requirements whatsoever. And we know that audiologists are very often the first time, the first person that's encountering, and they probably haven't graduated from Gallaudet. And these are people who have no training, so how can we close that gap? I think we need to work with Asha, and the two of us have worked with them a lot, but that's not an easy road at all. Uh, sometimes we feel like we're partners in crime in that uh, endeavor. I'm sorry, can you tell us what Asha is? Yes, it's the American Speech and Hearing Language Association. I think they have over 50 or 60,000 members and they have this huge headquarters with glass walls everywhere. Now they have uh, set, established a criteria uh, for uh, people who would get requirements from this and we met with them and we asked why isn't ASL listed as one of these requirements and their response was well it is. Well. I don't really think that's the case when they phrase it such as must have some awareness of sign language. That could mean anything from I understand it exists and I know that deaf people use this thing that they call ASL all the way to somebody who's truly fluent. How do we measure some familiarity with? Okay, so that's the medical profession, educators, and then the deaf community. We need to work directly with them. I would love it if each state provided mentorship programs at no charge to families. Minnesota is one of the eight states that actually has a wonderful deaf mentorship program. And some people say it could be better. I think it's really wonderful, and it's certainly a lot more than other states are offering. So again, we need to work with all of these groups to make some movement and progress. I would certainly agree with all of the comments, of course, but I would like to add something interesting. In the JCIH papers, uh, there is a requirement for all programs 
And one of the specific recommendations that the paper goes into is that people need to be involved within the within the EDI programs and systems, and to have deaf people in particular involved. If we could have deaf mentors and so forth, professionals going in and talking about how to request interpreters and all of the other things. If deaf people were there in the first place, I think the entire system would look different. I remember going to a conference many years ago. Uh, I was a meeting at a federal agency talking about EDI and the work. And within that, there was a picture of a deaf infant with a hearing aid. And everyone thought the picture was adorable, and there the deaf child was with a hearing aid. And there were two parents in the room, and certainly hearing aids are fine, which is what they and myself said, but it's a matter of language. And where is it that the people who are making decisions have deaf people at that table? It's been operating under the system for many years. So we have to continue to educate those individuals and everyone else. And I think it's wonderful that you're here, Matt, today, and your involvement and your work and the support that you have of sign language and the fact that parents have the right to choose as long as it's informed. And I think that's in line with all of the other recommendations that we as panelists are making as well. Yes, definitely. Thank you, Matt. You're right. Because to be honest with you, you know, I was thinking about all the things I already want to collaborate with you on. You know, uh, there's some common themes coming forth here. Oh, I think we, ha we, we have our other panelists with us. Ah, uh, yes, please come and join us. Our second parent is here. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Yes, we have a seat for you here. It's not a problem. Thank we you have very time much. for you. Had some car troubles. Welcome. Thank you. This is Tyrone Jackson. Hello, everybody. Um. Uh, Tyrone is a parent of a Kendall student. Uh, he has a daughter there. Uh, we have already done introductions of all the panelists, so uh, if you could just give us a really quick sort of synopsis. Tell us who you are. Uh, tell us about um, your experience as a father uh, of your daughter, if you could. Yes, sir. Um, okay. Uh, first, my name is Tyrone Jackson. Uh, I have a lovely and beautiful daughter, uh, Bria, who attends Gaudet. Uh She was born hearing. Um, but she had uh, caught meningitis. And uh, as she was being treated for the meningitis, it, uh, it took her hearing. Um, me and my wife, we've never experienced the deaf community outside of, you know, Mike running into a, a deaf person on the street saying hi and in passing. Um, but as we got into the culture, uh, we loved it. And we, and we love the fact that uh, you guys have embraced us and you guys have helped us along the way. Um, my daughter started in the PIP program when she was about a year uh, after her cochlear implant was um, activated. Um, and she's been here ever since. Uh, she loves Kendall. Um, she rushes to leave for the school bus every morning and she does not like to leave Kendall. Um, but as, as our walk uh, in the deaf community, uh, I wanna thank you guys uh, for just opening my eyes and broadening everything that we know um, because there's a lot of things that we didn't know. And now that we know, we can further assist other families who um, need cochlear implants or just any auditory uh, devices to help their children hear. Or if not, we can show them, hey, Kendall is a great school. Guy you that has a program where your child can learn everything that they need to learn and be successful in life. So um, again, thank you, and that's just, that's, that's where we are. Wonderful, and uh, thank you so much. Um, you know, most parents are not like, uh, most parents are like Tyrone, they're not like our other panelists here, right? Most of our parents of deaf children are hearing, and uh, much more often than not, they have a deaf infant, and it is, in fact, the first deaf person that they've ever met or seen in their lives. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Jackson, if you could perhaps give us uh, some thoughts on your experience 
and the Visual Language Visual Learning or VL2 lab and the findings that they've had on uh, the fact that the brain does not discriminate against language a modality be it spoken or signed and the importance of uh, deaf babies to have access to sign language from day one um, I, I would be interested in, in knowing your thoughts on that because it's hard science right oh, it's yes, uh, validating your own experience even and so if you met a new hearing parent who had just had a, an infant who is deaf what would your advice be to them well um, I, I love answering this question um, with the v2 program I, I believe that all children, both deaf and the children who do have auditory, should learn sign language anyway. So whether a child can hear or they can't, they should learn sign language because it is language. It is a form of communication. Um, I, I've, I've gotten to a, a few uh, verbal uh, arguments with people who are totally against cochlear implant. But I, 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 and the question I would pose to them, if your child could hear, and it was taken away from them, would you allow them to hear again? She got silent. I said, well, I don't know what you would do, but I, I did. Because you don't want to limit your child at all. You want them to have every opportunity. If they choose to uh, have auditory, okay. If they choose just to use sign language, okay. That's fine. But it's nothing wrong with having both. Being, bi being bilingual is awesome because now I can talk to my daughter and translate for my mom and have the same conversation and I'm still learning. So I think it is really awesome. Um, I think the, v the VL2 program is awesome um, because they've helped us tremendously, tremendously. Um, my daughter, when she, had men when she first caught meningitis, she couldn't, she, she didn't have any words. You know, she would make noise. Now my daughter can say words and my daughter can sign at three years old. That is amazing. So imagine what she can do another three years from now. Imagine what she can do another three years from that. So I'm just, I just, I'll just watch in amazement and I'm, I'm, I'm so proud of, of, of where she's come from. Um, and as far as, uh, if, as far as parents who have had hearing children and who don't hear now, I, I would advise them, yes, yes. If, if your doctor gives you the option, or matter of fact, give your doctor, can we, do we have any options that would allow my child to hear again? And follow that by going to, um, by, by having sign language as a part of their normal education. So if they're not getting taught at school uh, as a parent, you should learn because one day he might not choose to talk. That's, that's another reason why uh, me and my family uh, also chose this because as she gets an adult, to be an adult, she might not want her calculator anymore. And she might just want to stri strictly use sign language. No problem, because we're learning too. So if that's how you want to communicate to us, that's how you want to communicate to us. But at least you have an option. So I just don't want to limit our children. I believe all our children to have options. You know, I'm sure many of you know that VL2's work has conclusive findings, and some of the findings that have emerged or are still emerging uh, is the beginning recognition that visual language, in fact, helps a child broaden their span of view as, while they're reading the printed word. And it gives the brain access to more visual language in that way and develops in a different way. And so that helps for, with literacy skills. And that part of VL2's work really is making an impact not only on deaf children, but perhaps on all of humanity. And I think that that fits exactly in with what you were just talking about. So wonderful. All right, so thank you. And I think we're ready to move on to our next question. Uh, this is our second question here. I believe I, I thought we were moving on to our third, but in fact, our second question is about, uh, <clears throat> well, we know that policy and practice are critical, 
But perhaps what's even more important, and perhaps what can make an even larger impact on all deaf people, is the interpretation of policy. We know that deafness is low incident. We know that there are a lot of myths, misconceptions, and misunderstandings. And we talked about some of those today, and they've been held for quite a long time. People interpret laws incorrectly. People apply laws incorrectly to deaf children. So how do we raise the awareness of lawmakers, of educators, of deaf people, of parents, to ensure that they understand laws in a comprehensive way, thinking about the human capital that we have, right? There, here at Gallaudet, we're unparalleled in the world, and we have the unparalleled opportunity for advancement. So what can Gallaudet do to try to enhance that level of knowledge and awareness uh, for laws that are put into place, that are created, to ensure that they are interpreted and applied to our children correctly? Can you imagine what Gallaudet could do to address that? And anyone on the panel may answer. And of course, Gallaudet has a number of different departments, right? We have uh, the Clare Center, we have VL2 uh, on campus as well. There's the Department of Education, there's the Department of Public Affairs. There are a number of different departments and divisions here. So if we can think about all that Gallaudet has, what is it that we can do? Uh, um. I, I believe uh, just as just as when I was coming up in school, they mandated that we learn the foreign language. So we had to learn Spanish, we had to learn French, some Japanese. I think we should do that in our schools, in our public schools as well. Make it a mandate that we that we learn sign language because it's not it's not an ethnic. It's not a, it's not it has it has nothing to do with race or religion. It has nothing to do where you come from. This has, this has to do with communicating with someone who has lost their hearing. So, and that's, and that's thousands and millions of people across the world who, who don't hear. So why not mandate that our children learn it to communicate with other children who have hard time communicating with adults or children? Why not mandate the police force to use that with people who they might pull over and can't talk, and they can't communicate with them, but they do know sign language. You know, um, why not? If in case of emergencies, uh, a, fire, a, a firefighter who has to go into a house and rescue a person, but they can't, they can't, they can't verbalize with that person, but they, but they can sign to them to get them out of the fire. I mean, I just, I just think it's very important. I think it's very important that we try to exhaust every opportunity. Um, reach wherever we can reach for the people in the up in the up, up top that makes the decisions to that we put these programs and instill these programs for the the children coming up and the people who are already in the workforce to learn and so that they can help other people learn right and not all states do recognize ASL as a language mm -hmm. there is an increasing number of that but yes uh, Debbie We now have new platforms with Bobby Cordano as president. And we have an opportunity to collect, connect globally, to share information on a global scale. And so our opportunity now is to come together as a group of stakeholders and to work and focus on early intervention and figure out what it is that we can do as a community to get the information out there to find out who those people are that we should connect and the impact that we can make on early intervention. Are you talking about hosting some sort of collaborative meeting here? Yes, starting something here that would then work on who we're connecting with and what type of impact we can make and, and develop a plan uh, to look at what impact is necessary at the policy level. Uh, uh, with the CDC, uh, at the federal level, uh, locally here in DC, uh, we can really leverage Gallaudet and all that Gallaudet has to offer with the support of the VL2 research. Um, I think it might be a little bit broad, but I think it is something that needs to happen now. I think we can really get a very strong message out there. We have a very public platform, and the time is now to take advantage of that opportunity. 
Let's not forget the, important of stake, the importance of stakeholders such as legislators, our Congress, the United States Department of Education. How can we make sure they have all the information that is necessary? They're here in DC, we're here in DC, what can we do? So with Congress and the US Department of Education, there is high turnover, of course, and with that you have to go back again and again to the basics. And we know that VL2 has actually been to the White House, they were invited, and that certainly is wonderful, um, but you can't go every year or every four years. There are Capitol Hill briefings, and that is certainly a place where the message can be shared and has been repeatedly, but perhaps it's that people are forgetful or too busy, so we have to take the role to keep telling them. People might hate me for saying this, but I think that Gallaudet should set up an early intervention center. And so we could bring all of our efforts together centrally. Nobody is really looking at all of the work that is going on out there and bringing us together. Often we may refer people to te teacher training programs. Uh, we may maybe address mentorship programs in the states. Like you were saying, also there's a high turnover rate. And it's very important to develop these relationships with educators. And also we should look at grant opportunities with the health department. A person there could really be responsible and take the lead rather than every time we need information trying to find out where that exists. So I believe that if we had an early intervention center here at Gallaudet, that would be very helpful. Do you know, by the way, if you did a Google search, early intervention doesn't even show up uh, as a Gallaudet-related uh, topic. So I think we need to centralize everything in a single office, bring all of the efforts together. I know all of us are doing amazing work, but who's really cognizant of everything that is going on out there and bringing all of our work together in a synergistic manner? I agree with Beth. We have a lot of resources out there, but sometimes it's a little overwhelming and I don't know where to start. Even as a deaf person, having a deaf child, I struggled. So I can only imagine how hearing people feel encountering this. There's a lot of information out there and it is not coordinated, it is not centralized. We do have the findings from VL2 and that is very significant information, but the name is somewhat intimidating, VL2. I think that's all too highfalutin and it doesn't really apply to me. And perhaps other parents feel the same way. They might feel that that research is a little bit too scientific for them. So we need to present the ideas and we need to present the work in a way perhaps that's more friendly. Uh, and I think that it, because it is science-based, we're not always reaching out to the audiences that we need to. And I can speak to that personally. Now, as a deaf parent, um, I realize that I have an additional responsibility, which is to mentor hearing families. I know we're all busy. I do have my own children. But I really do see this is my responsibility. Uh, my second son's class, he's in, a, he's, in a, he's in the PIP program even for two years. It was still a little hard for him to make an adjustment. And I think, you know, because of some isolation and so forth, and finally I got to sit and talk with the teacher, with other parents. And in just those simple interactions, I see how much everybody learns. And I tell people, make sure you need, you know, take, your, take time, five minutes, ten minutes, to reach out to these people. We are the ambassadors of the deaf community. We are the front lines when it comes to our children. Now, in my second son's classroom, uh, there were 12 students last year, so that was very big. And this year, there's only six. And it's because uh, they've all gone to other schools. So they're all involved with the PIT program for such a brief time. And we have to really use that time to emphasize how important lang language exposure is, regardless of what kind of amplification you may choose. We as deaf parents are more responsible to get the message out there. And it's not only, 
you know, I don't really feel like it's an obligation, it's a joy. I think all of us really need to be more involved with that. And like I said, the VL2 findings, I think, need to be a, a little more user-friendly. And when you're speaking not just to deaf parents, but also to hearing parents who have had this experience, like Tyrone here and his experience with his child, right? And could Gallaudet perhaps do more in terms of providing parent training and support so that uh, then we could you know, do that job with other parents as well? I think that's a really great idea. Yeah, I do see more and more mentorship programs. Uh, but I think deaf people need to learn how to provide that type of mentorship. Actually, Dr. Stewart, I believe you wanted to hop in here. Thank you very much. The, um, there's a well-known um, story of Alex's lemonade stand. And Alex's lemonade stand is the story of a little girl who had a terminal cancer. And she set up a lemonade stand not to help herself, but to help other children. And her story is so compelling and so tearful, really. It's been made into a book. And now, if different groups want to raise money, they can get a packet from the foundation on how to set up their own fundraising in Alex's name to benefit whatever group they want. Mm -hmm. In a similar idea, there was a little boy who was traveling with his family in Italy, and he was fatally injured in a car accident. Well, his parents decided to donate Nicholas's organs to a different country, to a different group of people. And there's the most beautiful sculpture to celebrate Nicholas's life with 16 different bells. Each one makes a different note. And it's the 16 people that Nicholas saved. And when the wind goes through there, you can hear what's called the Nicholas effect. Now, as a fan of history, I think about Alice Cogswell. I think about Alice drawing symbols in the dirt for Mr. Gallaudet. And that's how he recognized that there was a brain in there. There was not dumbness. There was lack of speech. So Alice Cogswell served as this amazing symbol. And when I drive by her statue and I see her signing the letter A and looking up at Mr. Gallaudet with the primer letter A, I, it deeply moves me every single time I come here to this campus. And then the final idea to bring all this together is what about this notion of crowdsourcing? How do people get ideas together and how do they fund them and sustain them? Well, how do I help Alice tomorrow? What resources can I give her and what can Gallaudet as an institution provide? Well, if there were this ability to, say, sustain in a magnet language school, an ASL language program for interested students, and that wasn't taught by one super expert, but it was crowdsourced by loving parents who learned ASL, by loving professionals who know about the big D deaf community and understand ASL. That would be Alice's effect out in these community schools, and it could be right here in our magnet schools in Maryland, in Baltimore or DC, and extend out. And then each one of those people that learns ASL that then can communicate to a deaf person, I think that's how we have our little mustard seed that grows into a great big plant later. Um. Uh, actually, uh, thinking about your profession uh, as a physician and the idea of pre-service, uh, medical school, uh, in-service being uh, practicum and, and residency, uh, how can we better get VL2's work into those settings, share that, the findings there? And I know it's not an easy question to answer, but do you have any thoughts uh, about what Gallaudet could do uh, in terms of trying to bring that information and raise the awareness uh, that the brain does not discriminate against language modality? So this idea might seem a little bit silly, but I've been thinking a lot about what happened worldwide with the game Pokemon Go. Hey. How on earth did that become such a worldwide phenomenon? Right. It's fun. If Gallaudet sent me a link that said, we want you to take this primer, it's a very simple children's book. We're going to teach you, and you're going to have fun. I'm going to teach you the different signs for your basic Dr. Seuss book. And at the end of that little link presentation, you're going to get a reward, a token, Gallaudet One token. Maybe I can convert that to Starbucks. I don't know. <laughs> it rewards me for my learning, and I can share that with people. 
I can share that with my friends. I can share that with mm -hmm. my patients. I can share that with that new mom who, just like you said, is the first deaf person they ever met was her new baby so that she can learn and her dad can learn. Mm -hmm. So that we have this, and the people who know how to do that programming and who know how to do that web-based interface, they're already here. Yep. That's one of the extreme strengths and powers of the VL2 and the other, and the other labs here at Gallaudet. Mm -hmm. So if you could make it fun and make it more widely distributed as this great thing, I would do it for sure. Um, I, I totally agree with everyone on the panel. Um, as a deaf person, as a deaf parent, as a deaf son, mother, or daughter, it is everybody's obligation to teach somebody else. It's everyone, as, as when, when I found out that my daughter was going to be deaf, I didn't know what to do. I would not have known about Gallaudet that had the PIP program. I would have not known about a cochlear implant if someone who had the knowledge didn't share that with me and my wife. So now imagine all the cases that are in this world who children who aren't born deaf or are born deaf don't know the resources to reach out to help their children. But we could be standing next, we could be standing next to one and not even never know it because they've not shared the info. If we go out and we make it our business to teach somebody at, at, at the school, just like, just like the doctor said, if we, go to, if we go to our children's school and we go to the principal and ask, is there any way that we can start up a sign language program to teach our kids? It doesn't really matter how many show up. But that if we make the effort to go out and do it, something's going to happen. Mm -hmm. that, that is our mustard seed. So I've always been brought up on this fact. Each, each person teach a person. That is the only way we're going to get it. If we keep sign language to ourselves and only in our community, that's exactly where it's going to stay. If we go out into other communities, into other avenues, then that's exactly where it'll be. So I think if we plant these seeds in other places, if we go to other places and, and just touch, touch other families, because me and my wife, we have, it's, it's been a number of families who have come to us and have asked us, I don't know what to do. My child is an infant. Can you please help me? We could have said, well, I don't know. That would have limited that child and we don't know what kind of damage that would have done to that parent. But instead, now their child can hear because they chose to take our advice. They chose to come to Gallaudet and reach out to Gallaudet because Gallaudet reached out to us. And we said, thank you. And now our daughter, like I said, we can sign, my daughter can sign, and my daughter also can talk. She has no limit, she has no ceiling. And I, and I want that for all of our children, not just mine, I want not just yours, but the children who don't know, the children who aren't here yet. I want that for all of them. So whatever we have to do collectively to get that out, I think we all should just get together and do it and make it happen. Yeah. Thank you, yes, thank you. Uh, I think we will now move on to our third and final question. So we know that VL2's work has proven that the brain wants access to language regardless of how that language is shared. The brain is ready for it and wants to see it. So now we're asking about what issues need to be researched further? What things do we need to better understand? It could be research for VL2, it could be research that needs to be done in a different realm, in a different area, maybe it's not related to brain science, maybe uh, some other type of research that you can think of uh, that might need to be done that could answer some of those unanswered, critical, burning questions that we all have on our minds. Norma? My children's father um, uh, uh, set up our own YouTube channel 
and we like to film our children. And it's because we want to expose them to Spanish as well. And, you know, we, <laughs> we, we don't really know how it works and we're just trying to figure it out. We want to make sure that we are exposing them in the right ways in making sure that we're applying more appropriate strategies for working with more than two languages, for working with three. So you'd be interested in a trilingual approach and the impact that would have on deaf babies. Exactly, and what types of strategies and techniques should be used? I really feel like we're just uh, figuring it out as we go. Interesting, does anyone else have something they're wondering about? I'd be interested in knowing how families process the information uh, what hooks families in to really understand the needs of their children? Uh, we can put stuff out there, right? Uh, you know, but is there some magic formula or, or something that we could present to families that would really get them to understand immediately the importance of this information? Uh, and could we get that from you know, perhaps families that have been raising deaf children for a while, those who are newer to it? What could we as the deaf community do within you know, our communities to really look at that and, and identify that information? I think you said a similar thing, where you said that the findings from VL2 might be a little bit intimidating, and perhaps reframing it might be advantageous. I think that's a very good point. We really need to think about how we're delivering this message in a non-threatening, comfortable way. You know, the language that we use is so powerful in doing this. Absolutely. Framing is critical when we're providing services as well, right? We need to know what the research is, but we need to connect that to the service providers that are working on the front lines with families, as well as the teachers. And your point is, is that we do need to maybe research exactly that. The language that we use, what type of narrative are we using, what type of discourse are we having with legislators and educators? Absolutely. Good point. Um, Any other burning questions? I might be bringing forth a different perspective. I think that more research is certainly fine. I, I think research is welcome. But I also recognize that we have had screenings, we have early intervention, we have requirements, we have the JCIH recommendation in papers, we have accountability for schools as children are older. There are so many things in place so let's go with what we have. Let's make that work. Let's strengthen what's already available. And how would you recommend we go about doing that? Well, <laughs> again, I mean, think there are a lot of ideas that we've all been talking about as educators and as various individuals working with different communities and different settings. We need to provide more education for them. And we need to provide more education for them and using the example of deaf mentors, which have come up on this panel, and we see its presence slightly growing some, but it's new. Why wasn't that there in the first place when these systems were established originally? So we're still chasing some of these issues, and maybe it's a matter of education. I think it's maybe unfair of me to ask you that question because I think it's one that we've all been trying to answer for a very long time. How do we make what we have work? How do we make it more effective? Did you want to add something? I sometimes wonder if we need to find just one or two or three states and really work intensively with them. You know, like you said, to identify a strategy, to identify what our next steps are, rather than spreading ourselves out so thin. I mean, we're talking about 50 states, but really think about how many countries there are. And then think about how many systems and languages we need to encounter. So perhaps that's not realistic. So perhaps we should start with one or two states, build some strong programs that can be models for other states. Right now, we don't have a single model. How can we even move truly if we don't have a model that we can hold up? So I think we should maybe identify one or two states that we sense might be most receptive to this work. Great, there's a lot of wonderful uh, thoughts happening up here. Carol, how are we for time? Uh, can you tell me how much time we have left? Okay, we have just a few more minutes, so perhaps we could allow 
A uh, couple questions from the audience. Does anyone have a question that they would like to come up and ask of our panel? Okay, yep, yeah, you can come on up. Uh, if you could stand over here. We have our CDI on stage. So if you have a question, come stand over here. Mm -hmm. Actually. My name is Oscar. I work in the Tidal Mind project here in the Department of Linguistics. Tactile Mind. Tactile Mind in the Department of Linguistics, and I am a deafblind individual. So I really want to talk about something that's so important, and I agree that getting to these babies in infancy is so important. Now, I uh, became deafblind at five, and a mother just came to the TM office asking about uh, pro-tactile, which is known as PT, or PT-ASL, which increases access to language. And that opportunity is there for deafblind people. And thinking about charges um, disorder. And this, so I think what's important here is that we're not only thinking about deaf children, but we're thinking about deaf blind children. And there is a project here called Tactile Mind. And I think it's very important. All of this work is very important and very inspirational. Thank you very much. Uh, so you didn't have a question, uh, just a comment that you wanted to share with us? No, I do have a question. How, what about collaborating? Uh, because again, we have pro-tactile ASL and we have ASL. And I think we need to look at all those uses. You know, I think parents need to know about this information if necessary. So I think there needs to be more collaboration within the community. And I think they also need to, there needs to be more acceptance of the differences. Do you know what I mean? Would any of our panelists like to respond? I agree. I think that sometimes we certainly overlook that issue. And I'd like to let everyone know about a bill that we have in Congress. And it's not specifically focused on that early intervention. Early intervention. But is the amendment. amendment to the early inter Individuals with education. It's the amendment to the Individuals with uh, Disabilities Education Act, and it's called the Alice Cogswell Bill. And we have a group, we have several different stakeholder groups. There's a group of uh, deaf stakeholders, blind stakeholders, and deaf blind stakeholders. And so we are working on improvements for all of those stakeholder groups. And educational systems such as early intervention or uh, general education, they all have a uh, number of de deaf specialists and experts and, and those uh, experts in language as well. But we are trying to work on improving this situation. It's called HR 3535. If you want to, you can check it out online. There's a lot of information there. But I think that that would address some of the concerns you've raised. All right, thank you so much. Uh, checking on time again, because I know we are near the end here. So with that, I would like to um, ask if, I would like to ask the person for whom none of this would be happening without their presence to come to our stage. Uh, President Bobby Cordano, do you have a few comments that you'd like to share on what you've uh, seen from the panel here, what we've talked about with uh, Gallaudet and the future, and help us move forward? Dr. Cordano? Excuse me, President Cordano? It has been an honor to hear you all speak just to have you here a part of our panel. Thank you so very much. One thing that I think we should have mentioned at the beginning is that Dr. Stewart is also on our Board of Associates here at Gallaudet University. And at my very first meeting with the Board of Associates, the topic that we had uh, discussed at that meeting was the position paper that I had released about language acquisition and the myths surrounding language acquisition and sign language. 
And we had that conversation, and I think we became strange bedfellows. You know, having a doctor there, a part of this discussion, serving as a surgeon who does a lot of the cochlear implant work, and then being here at the university advocating for sign language education. <laughs> so I think that maybe you have more of between an the two of you. than I do. But what you see happening here this evening with this discussion, this is the richness of the diverse perspective that we have, a part of our world. We have families who have children who are learning language. And there is a shared passion that we can see with all the people who are here. There's so much that brings us all together. And the hope that I've felt from hearing from all of you speak was probably some of the highest hopes that I've ever had of knowing what's possible and being able to build this vision together. I think that you've built the platform for this to continue to happen and to think about how we can get the message out can start from here. I think some of the planning work can take place and I think we wouldn't be mad at you, Beth, for some of the recommendations and the, the vision and the dreams that you'd like to see happen here at Gallaudet. Thank you. I think that the point is that what you've talked about here is a great idea. I think that all of the ideas that we've talked about are worth considering and figuring out how we can make this happen and, make, and see what's possible. So you've given us a lot to think about, a lot to consider for the potential of raising money for some of these ideas to come to fruition and then how we can best structure this work here at Gallaudet. How we can network with parents. We've talked about the importance of the moral obligation as deaf individuals to be able to support others and not just ourselves. I think it's time to no longer keep this language to ourselves, but to make sure that it is shared with the rest of the world. I think we also need to love our children and make sure that we are meeting the needs of our children for today and for tomorrow. Thank you all again for being here. Thank you for coming. This has been great. And in closing, it is obvious once again that VL2 has a clear message. Infants can't wait. The window closes very quickly. And so the opportunity for language exposure and development needs to start on day one and needs to be provided for deaf children through visual means as well as other means that are accessible. So with your comments and with you coming here, you really represent a whole nother window that has now opened for us. And that is the window into our future and into the future of the field of deaf education. We are now at a make or break time. And you bring hope with your vision, your passion, and your commitment to the translation of this new science and these new findings that VL2 represent for us and the serious change that can take place within our systems and the way that we work with our parents of our beloved deaf children. So thank you so much for that. Thank you, and I think that we've seen a shift in what's been said here. I don't know if anybody else noticed the shift with what was stated. The, the original quote was, deaf children cannot wait. And I think that after hearing from some of these individuals speak, that our language is now different, saying that <laughs> babies cannot wait. So we've heard you loud and clear. Uh, it's like yesterday. We had the panel on global leadership. And someone mentioned uh, the famous quote that it takes a village to raise a deaf child, right? It, it will take all of us. Uh, to approach this task. This is a large community and we all need to be involved in really changing the future of deaf education for all of our deaf children now and the, the infants that are still to come and the language acquisition they need. So thank you all so much for being here with us. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you.